Hi, friend. We are wrapping up Exodus chapter 19 and 20. What an amazing passage of scripture. We have learned so much about who the Lord is. And really, I think implicit in these chapters are his love, his heart for his people, uh, his desire for their good. And, you know, he makes it abundantly clear that, look, I have brought you up out of Egypt. I have rescued you from this house of slavery. This is my work. And implicit in that is, look, (laughs) I'm doing that because I see you and know you and care about you and love you. Uh, I, I haven't just randomly done this. No, I have rescued you. And as he says in chapter 19, I have brought you to myself. I love that. That shows God's, it just shows his heart for his people, that he is a God of love, a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God of uh, compassion, and just genuine kindness to his people, that he would set them apart and say, look, I am uh, I am making you my treasured possession, uh, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. I am setting you apart. Why? Because you're really special? No, that's not it. Uh, because I have rescued you. I am doing this so that you might intercede, that you might live out a relationship with me in the world, that other nations, that other people, that all people and all the world will know me. All right, so, (laughs) wow, I just kind of went off there, didn't I? Summarizing what took place, we saw at the beginning of Exodus chapter 19, the people arrived to Mount Sinai. And in a sense, this ought to take our breath away, right? Because we were there at the beginning of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3. This is where Moses has his first encounter with Yahweh. And he promised Moses, as he called Moses to be this leader of his people to help rescue them out of Egypt, he had promised Moses, look, I will bring you back to this mountain with the people. You and the people will serve me here. And wow, I get goosebumps just saying that. Listen, when God speaks, it is so. We can trust his word. We can trust his word promises. And wow, even as I say that, I think that is so appropriate for this week's message because God does go on here at Mount Sinai. He gives them a word. And I didn't really talk about that this week. As I reviewed these discussion questions, I was a little disappointed with how I phrased a couple of the questions. Questions eight and nine, I used the word commandments. Friends, that word commandment, that was nowhere in Exodus chapter 19 or 20. That word is not used at all. Instead, we see word used. Um, Word, (laughs) word, this is, oh, where did I put it? Hmm, I'm not sure. This is this is God speaking, and he is giving a word. Oh, he's making a statement. That's what a word is. It is a statement. So we have somehow along the way uh, have called these not the 10 words, but the 10 commandments. So just by the way I wrote questions 8 and 9, that just shows I came into this lesson or I came into writing this book with my own assumptions, my own presuppositions about this passage. Friends, those have been blown out of the water after studying this week. Um, Yes, I see where we get the word commandment. Uh, These are imperative. Uh, These are imperative. But really what we are seeing is God 
sharing his heart with the people. Uh, he is speaking and he is speaking words. He is speaking statements to them. And what is absolutely phenomenal about uh, this week's chapters is that God speaks to them. Like he speaks directly to them. Uh, Moses brings them out to the foot of Mount Sinai. God descends onto that mountain and it is, it is fearsome, right? There's lightning, there's thunder, there's, um, there's fire, there's, uh, clouds, there's smoke, there's this loud trumpet sound. The mountain is trembling and the people are are trembling. Yes, they are afraid as well. They should be. That was intentional on God's part. Um, I, we we see in in chapter nineteen nine. He says, "Look, uh, I am meeting with them. They are going to have an encounter with me. They are going to hear my voice, that they might believe forever." This is his good for them. See, he wants their good. He wants them to believe in him forever. Uh, Moses also tells the people, chapter uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 20, Moses tells them, look, this is a test. And what is God doing? What is he testing? He's testing your faith. He's testing your belief for him. Uh, will you hear him? And then will you follow him? Uh, he, he, is, he is telling you, he is speaking to you his word, his heart to help you not sin to help you know, give you clear instructions on how to follow him, how not to sin. And he is doing this in such a way that he wants you to fear him, not to be shaking in your boots, afraid of him, dreading him in some way. No, but to revere him, to worship him, to seek to serve him, truly to seek to love him. And that just shines, doesn't it? That shines in these 10 words that he gives to the people of Israel. The first four words show them how to love God. Um, and then the rest of them, the last six, show them how to love others. He gives very, very explicit words, explicit, well, we can call them commands. That's what they've been called through the ages um, on, on how to follow him. Um, oh, I feel like I lost my thought on something that I really, really wanted to say here about his words. Uh, let me just look at the questions. The review questions might help me remember. Consider why God would need to command such things. And, and why doesn't he just summarize the commands into love me and love others here? Friends, I think we need to remember who the people of Israel are, what has taken place, this journey that they have been on. Friends, they have been in Egypt for 430 years, for centuries, and they've been slaves for decades. They have lived uh, in this ancient Near East culture where it would be unthinkable that only one God could be God, right? It, it, that would just be, that, that, that's unthinkable thinkable. And so the way, like if we go back to Egypt, we see that there's literally hundreds, thousands of gods there. And it was pretty easy to serve a God. You had a little idol, uh, you went in, you gave it some food because it was believed that gods couldn't feed themselves. So you fed them and the God is going to bless you. Uh, it was pretty easy to just go in, feed the God, and then leave. There was nothing about that that connected with the heart. Uh, you could go in, feed the God, 
earn your blessing, but then go about and live however it is you wanted to live. It could be uh, going about living in a in in continuing to be a very selfish and immoral person. This is the world the people of Israel have been living in. So it truly is God's grace. It's His goodness. It's His kindness to give them explicit ideas on how to follow him, how to worship him as the one true God, as their God, as Yahweh. Um, and that, that involves having no other gods, no idolatry. That means keeping his name set apart, not using his name in vain because names display character. We have to put on our ancient Near East glasses to understand that a name conveys so much. So would never want to use his name uh, in some, some sort of empty way. And then to keep the Sabbath day holy. Why? Is that a, to be a legalistic thing? Kind of where we're going and feeding God and following a rule? No, this is a day set apart to rest, to enjoy God, to remember who he is and what it is that he has done. All of this is about loving God and God giving them clear instructions on what this looks like with him. This is a this is a new relationship. This is a new way of serving a God. And this God is Yahweh, the God most high, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And then How is it then that we should love others? All of these other little gods didn't explain that. No, there was always a wrestling match on who is greater and uh, kind of a a one-upsmanship. Um, no, loving others, God, again, gives very clear instructions. Look, honor your mother and father. Never kill. Never steal. Never commit adultery. Never bear false witness. Never covet. Uh, these are just basic ways, and it can be extrapolated, these um, these words, these ways of loving others really encompass every way that we can love others and truly displays God's heart for us. He doesn't want, he's not a God that just wants fed. He's not a God that wants just a, a simple sacrifice. Um No, he is a God that is after whole hearts. He is testing for whole hearts, whole belief, whole faith. He wants all of us. He wants a relationship. He wants our heart to be connected with his heart. And we even got a taste of that as we talked about yesterday. He gives them uh, 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 clear instructions on how to appropriately worship him, appropriately uh, make sacrifice to him. And again, we just saw this is so much more than just feeding the God. No, God wants broken, contrite hearts. He wants a holy fear. He wants a reverence. Um, But what he wants so much more than that is that we would love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus said this. He said it so clearly. It's recorded in Mark chapter 12, verse 33. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. All the people of Israel have a lot to learn about what it means to love and honor Yahweh and love and honor one another as they come out of this house of slavery. And I think the same remains true for us today.